Good morning and welcome to the service of Big Springs Community Church. God calls us to worship with these words. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the end to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us uh, with his greeting. To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Big Springs Community Church, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we are gathered together here on this your most holy day as your holy nation and your children to worship you and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. We worship and praise you that you have given him to us as our Savior to bless us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And as his disciples, may we consecrate this hour to your praise and your heavenly word, turning our thoughts away from our earthly cares and worries. May all the words that we sing and pray and hear be from our hearts and an aroma a pleasing aroma of life for us. Through Christ our Savior, who together with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God dwelling in heaven forever and ever. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing, My Heart Steadfast God. This is number 108, uh, part of the uh, call to worship. As we do every Lord's Day in our worship service, uh, near the beginning of our service, uh, we open with a reading of the law. And this law is God's will for our lives. Uh, and they are found all throughout the Bible, all throughout the scriptures. So God's will for our lives, um, is, the summary of it is in the Ten Commandments. But... Uh, we find it also in Colossians chapter 3. So I will read from verse 12, uh, verses 12 to 17. God's will for our lives. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, 
to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So these are very, very um, uh, good exhortations for Christian living. And we know that uh, we don't always uh, do these things. Uh, we are not able to except through the work and the help of the Holy Spirit. So this um, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another in love, all those are hard things to do um, even inside the church. And this is, uh, Paul is exhorting the church, uh, the congregation in Colossae. Uh, Colossae. Um, and this one, he is not addressing here unbelievers. He's addressing within the community or the communion of saints. So as uh, we know that we fall short of God's law, he calls us to acknowledge and confess and repent of our sins. So let us pray. Almighty God, since you delay with so much patience and punishments, which we have observed, uh, deserve and daily drawn ourselves, grant that we may not indulge ourselves, but carefully consider how often and how in many different ways we have provoked your anger against us. May we learn humbly to present ourselves to you for forgiveness and with true repentance plead for your mercy. With all our heart, we desire to submit ourselves to you whether you chastise us, rebuke us, or according to your infinite goodness, forgive us. Let our condition ever be blessed, not by flattering ourselves, but by finding you to be our kind and bountiful Father in heaven. Reconcile to us in your only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. So from Colossians 2, again reading from the book of Colossians, we read this assurance of forgiveness of sins when we confess and repent of our sins. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This is set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so what uh, we hear from God here is that when we confess of our sins and uh, have faith and trust in Christ, our Lord, he went to the cross and by giving, uh, going to the cross to die for our sins, he canceled the record of death. Uh, like a like a, a a bank canceling all our debt. I'm not talking about uh, student loans here. Uh, the record of debt that we owe to God because of our sins, He canceled all of them, all of them, by going to the cross for our sins. So let us come to God's throne of grace. Let us pray. O oh, holy and merciful God, this morning we gazed upon the beautiful sunrise of a new day that you have made a holy day of worship. We are in awe of your beautiful creation around us. We praise you for the sun, the rain, and the snow that you give us throughout the year. But most of all, we thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and Lord of our life. We pray for the specific needs of our own congregation here. We pray for the pastor and the leaders of our church to make them wise and, and prudent in their decisions. We pray for those who are grieving over the loss of loved ones. We pray for the sick 
or those recovering from surgery, for those who are jobless, and those who don't have enough food on the table, and for those who are lonely. We pray again this morning for Leo, for B, for uh, Sue, for Helen Thompson, for Anita Hogan, and also for Pastor Bernie Vanny. Comfort them. Give them peace in their hearts so that uh, you, uh, they have hope in you. We pray for our federal and local governments because you ordain the authorities to whom your children are to submit. We know that with freedom comes responsibility, and with responsibility comes judgment and consequences. Our freedoms must be carefully exercised. In the freedom you have given us, grant us wisdom, self-restraint, and discernment. We pray that all our leaders, even those who are not believers, would govern according to your precepts and will, and that the church would not be harmed in any way under their terms. You have ingrained in their minds your law for the good of your people and for the common good. We thank you this morning for your holy church worldwide. Be with her and sustain her through rich times and poor. Prepare her, her for adversity and strengthen her within it. Build her in faith and also in numbers. Grant her a purity for love of Christ and godly worship. We pray for our church here in Big Springs and your church worldwide, that we would grow in grace, mercy, love, and endurance, and from one glory to another, that we would be made into the very image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray, we should pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today our offerings will be for the general fund. This is an exhortation from 2 Corinthians 9. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This morning, in relation to our lesson, uh, we will read uh, together uh, three questions and answers from the Heidelberg Catechism. So these questions and answers are um, 65, 83, and 84. And this is about preaching. So I will read the questions and we will read the answers together. Question 65. It is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all his benefits. Where then does faith, that faith come from? Answer. The Holy Spirit works it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacraments. Question 83. What are the keys of the kingdom? Answer. 
the preaching of the holy gospel and Christian discipline toward repentance. Both of them open the kingdom of heaven to believers and close it to unbelievers. Question 84. How does preaching the holy gospel open and close the kingdom of heaven? Answer. According to the command of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is opened by the prophet publicly declaring to all believers, each and every one, that as often as they accept the gospel promise in true faith, God, because of Christ's merit, truly forgives all their sins. The kingdom of heaven is closed, however, by proclaiming and publicly declaring to unbelievers and hypocrites that as long as they do not repent, the wrath of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. God's judgment, both in this life and in the life to come, is based on this gospel testimony. Our scripture readings today will be uh, from Isaiah chapter 12, and this is, uh, we will read verses 3 to 6, and then we will read a few verses from Colossians chapter 1. The word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 12, beginning with verse 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And then from... Colossians chapter 2, we will read verses 26 to 28. The word of the Lord. I mean, Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. The mystery, this is uh, Paul talking about the mystery of uh, the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel to the Gentiles also. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. O oh Lord, by your Spirit, help us to read, mark, learn, 
and inwardly digest the truths of these passages for the saving good of our souls. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Congregation of Christ, Years ago, I saw an ad uh, of a church looking for an, uh, what they call an executive pastor. So some of the qualifications and duties required were, and this is from that ad on the web, uh, it says, a proven track record of effective staff leadership and development, exceptional organ organizational skills, and excellent oral and written communication skills. Lead the development of integrated plans across ministries. A close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And a bachelor's degree and a strong background in business and organization management. So, uh, the, does it sound like looking for a pastor of a church? So the important theme that we can glean from this ad is leadership and management skills. What about the primary duties of a pastor being a minister of the word and sacrament? The educational requirement is a bachelor's degree related to business management. Is the church looking for a pastor or a CEO? In this simple ad, notice the absence of any requirement for preaching skills and Bible training and knowledge. How then can this executive pastor lead the congregation when there is no knowledge of the doctrines of preaching and worship? So today we start a four-part series on the doctrine of biblical teaching or preaching, a doctrine lost in the unbiblical image of the preacher and preaching today. So in this series, we will study a passage from Colossians 1, beginning from, verses, from verse 21 to verse 29. So the Apostle Paul starts the passage by explaining how the Colossians were formerly unbelieving Gentiles or non-Jews. They were alienated from and hostile to God, but in Christ have now been reconciled to God. Then he goes on to describe his labor as he preached to make Christ known to the Colossian church. Paul then shifts the focus to describe his own work, even in his sufferings to make the word of God fully known to them by preaching the gospel. So the purpose of his labor of preaching is to present the Colossian saints holy and blameless and above reproach before God. So our theme in this first part of this doctrine of preaching is the dual purposes of preaching. So the first purpose is to make known and to make mature. So we often hear pastors uh, preaching to meet the felt needs of their congregation, felt needs. So like restoring broken relationships, avoiding debt, curing loneliness, improving low self-worth, and maintaining physical health, even though that thing. And these are what most unrepentant sinners would like to hear with their itching ears. But what does Paul say in Colossians 1 that are the most pressing needs of sinners? They need to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to God's kingdom. Verse 13. They need redemption and forgiveness of sins. Verse 14. They need to be recreated into the image of the Son of God, to submit under his rule and to escape the curse of death. This is from verses 15 through 18. Sinners need to be reconciled and have peace with God and be holy and blameless before him. Verses 19 through 21. These verses 
that come before our te uh, text describe the, the true needs, not the felt needs, but the true needs of sinners, which are recognition of their sinful nature and repentance and faith. Paul says that this message of salvation and peace has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven in verse 23. So meaning not the whole wide world, but the Roman world, the Roman Empire under heaven, and to both Jews and Gentiles. So because of Christ's work of reconciliation, the Colossians, people who need, uh, who used to be outside of God's covenant promises, outside of God's kingdom, now share in the heavenly inheritance of all believers. In the Old Covenant, uh, Israel, the nation Israel, was merely a foreshadow of God's universal church. The whole world was divided into two peoples, two peoples only, Israel, God's chosen nation, and all other peoples outside of God's covenant, whom the Bible calls Gentiles. But in the New Covenant, all of God's covenant people are those who have been united to Christ by faith and are called children of Abraham. Children of Abraham, whether they are Jews or Greeks, slave or free, male or female. So we read that from Galatians 3, 28. The purpose of preaching is to call Gentiles out of their alienation from God's kingdom hostility against God, and doing evil works. Verse 21. Preaching is God's way of making known to sinners how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 27. So this mystery is God's unfolding plan for the world especially for Gentiles who were formerly outside of God's covenant nation. So this plan was hidden for ages before Christ came. And that through the Messiah, the Messiah's life, death, and resurrection, he will redeem sinners from all nations to give them the hope of glory. And that is what we read in the few verses in Isaiah chapter 12. All the nations, this gospel will be made known to all the nations. The prophets of the Old Testament already saw some elements of this hidden mystery, but is now revealed in Christ and unfolding before the eyes of Christians when he came into the world. So through Paul, God then unfolded this mystery of the redemption of Jews and Gentiles from all nations. And now God is creating one new man in place of two. So in the place of two, there were uh, Jews and Gentiles before. The Jews were God's people. The Gentiles were not. Now he's building one new man, Christians, Jews and Gentiles from the two, in place of the two. Preaching in the Old Testament law, prophets, and psalms was primarily to God's people Israel. But now, preaching is chiefly to Gentile nations to make Christ known to them. They are being called out of their idolatry to worship the Son of God in whom is the only way of salvation. Preaching is widened to include not only Jews in Jerusalem and in Judea, but also outward to Gentiles in Samaria and to all the nations of the world. Not only to all the nations of the Roman Empire, but later on to all the nations of the world. God himself is fulfilling his promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. In you, in you, Abraham, all the nations 
of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed through your son, Jesus Christ, through your descendant, Jesus Christ. Now, even the language of preaching has changed. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles preach to the, to the diverse crowds of Jews gathered in Jerusalem. But what did they hear? They heard the gospel from unlearned men, mostly from Galilee, in their own tongues. They said, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles, although raised speaking the ancient Hebrew language, preached and wrote in Greek, the lingua franca of the Roman world. And so even the writers of the 1647 Westminster Confession of Faith uh, that met in the Westminster Abbey in London, even the, them, proud Englishmen and Scots, recognized the new language of the new covenant. They said in uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, Article 1, Paragraph 8, it says, Because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God, the scriptures are to be translated into the common language of every nation unto which they come. So this is why the Bible has been translated into all the major languages of the world. But you may ask, uh, how many different languages, not dialects, languages, how many different languages are there, there in the whole world? So some may say 500, no? Not 500, not 1,000, not 5,000. There are over 7,000 languages in the world. And most people today confuse the words dialect with languages. So a general differentiation between languages and dialects is whether two or more spoken languages or dialects are mutually intelligible or mutually understandable to, uh, to those people. So for example, uh, Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians mutually understand each other without acquiring each other's languages. And so are they dialects or languages? We consider them languages, even though they are mutually intelligible to each other. Um, so another example is Cantonese and Mandarin, uh, which are mutually unintelligible. And is, is that right? Um, so they are different languages. They don't understand each other, although they are all ethnically Chinese. Um, so, um, what about English and Spanish and Portuguese and Italian? They are mostly mutually unintelligible. So they are different languages. In the Philippines, you might be surprised how many languages are there. They, they will say, how many dialects? No, these are languages. Maybe 20, 50, 100? No, there are over 180 languages not dialects, because most of them are mutually unintelligible in the Philippines. Sometimes uh, when, when we live there, um, Evelyn and I, we cross a river, and the people across the river would speak a language that we don't even know, just across the river or across a valley. Talking about Babel, today, Babel is being reversed because hundreds of translations are being done even in the remotest parts of the world in order that salvation will be made known among the Gentiles. Therefore, in, in the age to come, 
it may be that all believers will be speaking one heavenly language, the language of one eternal kingdom. Or it may be that we will all be speaking our own native languages, but we will be understanding each other without translation. And that's how, the, how God the Holy Spirit will, will work. Maybe that will be the case. We don't really know. So that is making known to the Gentiles the salvation through Christ. So secondly, the other goal of uh, preaching is to make the saints, to make the saints, to make the believers mature in Christ. So the great uh, goal of preaching in the New Covenant is not only to bring salvation to God's chosen people. It is not merely to bring them to a sure knowledge of the gospel, but also to a wholehearted faith and trust in Christ as Savior. So Christ has now reconciled Colossian believers and you yourselves in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him on the last day. So as, as sinners reconciled to God, you are being transformed daily from sinners outside of God's kingdom to a people who are holy, blameless, and above reproach before the sight of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ is now working in you to present you holy and blameless, just as the Old Testament described the animal sacrifices presented to the priests before God. So even the Levitical priests themselves must also be clean without blemish before they could enter the temple or the tabernacle to make sacrifices for the people. Such is the foreshadow of Christ, the Passover lamb without blemish, the sinless high priest who would offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of his people, his people who will believe in him as Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit is working in you to accomplish this final goal of preaching. You are being made holy, cleansed from all sin, and wholly separated, consecrated unto God for his service. You are being made blameless without any blemish or defect whatsoever, like the Old Testament animal sacrifices. You are being made to be completely above reproach. No one will accuse you of any fault or any wrongdoing. And these are things that will be before us or happen to us on the last day when Christ returns. So later, Paul summarizes this idea as spiritual maturity in Christ. So the goal of preaching is to bring us all to spiritual maturity as we learn Christ. Paul looks forward to that day when finally Christ will bring his people to his Father and present them perfect, complete, and mature in him. On that day, Paul, all the apostles and prophets, and all faithful ministers will see the fruits of their labors when they present you as a pure virgin to Christ guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blameless. This will happen when Christ returns from heaven and takes us up to before his Father in heaven, presents us as pure, unblemished saints in Christ. So to this end, preaching Christ is called evangelism because it brings the good news or evangel of salvation from sin and death and God's wrath by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone but many Christians have this wrong idea that the gospel is only for unbelievers 
And that preaching is evangelistic only in the sense of preaching to the unsaved, to bring them to faith in Christ. So this is far from biblical. The gospel is not only for unbelievers, but also for believers like you. When Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, he spoke of his obligation to all, Greeks and non-Greeks, wise and foolish, addressing Roman believers in Romans 1, whom he had never personally seen before. He wrote to them that he was eager to preach the gospel to you who also are in Rome. So no, the gospel must continue to be preached Lord's day in, Lord's day out, day in, day out. Christ's life of perfect obedience, his atoning sacrifice for our sins and his resurrection from the dead for our justification and holiness must be preached every Lord's day. Why? Because like Israel of old, you will hear God's word one day and then the next day you are rebels and unbelievers or in, in unbelief. We are forgetful people. We are no different from Israel. We are as forgetful as they were. And this is why Paul tells believers in Corinth, he says, now I would remind you, remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. We need constant reminders of the saving and transforming gospel of Christ. The Bible is not a manual for living and for helping the poor in the world. You can get the same guidelines from Confucius or Gandhi or Joyce Meyer or Joel Austin or other pagans. But these guidelines are not the same saving gospel to bring you to maturity. Christ's ultimate goal in preaching is the presentation of his people as complete, perfect, and mature on the last day. So Paul writes to us, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ. He will establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord with all his saints. He will present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Christ, pastors and teachers in his church, were appointed by him to serve the church. And he, it says in Ephesians 4, um, we, they are to serve the church until we all attain to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the goal of preaching is not only to rescue individual sinners from their desperate condition in sin. Rather, preaching also aims to gather them as an assembly of the Lord, maturing and worshiping together as earthly pilgrims in a heavenly Mount Zion every Lord's Day, as we worship together in this place. So, beloved friends, many of you have listened to preaching in the church for years. Some of you even for your whole life. Be mindful that the preaching of the true gospel has brought you into faith in Christ by the working of the Spirit. God's mighty work of saving His people and reconciling them to him through Christ have been made known to you through the preaching of the word of God. But the preaching of the gospel does not stop after you believed. 
It is not only the unsaved who need to hear the atoning death of Christ for their sins. Rather, you who have already believed need to hear the gospel of salvation, the gospel of walking faithfully with Christ through the Holy Spirit, and the gospel of Christ presenting you holy and blameless on the last day before our God. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and this grand, glorious text in the book of Colossians. We ask that you bless your precious word to us. Write it upon our hearts in order that we may grow in our faith and knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And for those who are still in unbelief, and rebellion against you and your commandments, pour out your Holy Spirit upon their hearts, so they too will also have faith and repentance from their sins through the preaching of your Holy Gospel. For it is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now receive God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.